Hi brothers and sisters, as we entry into the Lenten season, we are reflecting on our faith and ourselves because it greatly affects and influence our daily activities as Christians while we interact with our non-Catholics brothers and sisters. Let's add to this reflection the study of things that have a significant reason and effect on each of us. Let's study and reflect how the Bible began, was formed, written, and compiled, how the Holy Spirit worked in the Catholic Church in gathering the Holy Manuscript, how it was formed and spread throughout the world. It's not enough that we study the writings in the Bible, but it's very important that we know where it came from, how it was formed, and why it is called the Word of God. According to jokes, it's not possible that the Bible just fell and was caught by a person and introduced to the world, but it was written by the holy writers through the inspiration of Lord God to the people he gave inspiration to so he could introduce himself, his plans and rules in our relationship with him, and the Catholic Church in the 4th century collected, compiled and canonized the holy manuscript, then Pope Sericius called it the collection of books or the Bible. I dedicate this to the Lord God for my fellow men who wish to research while on a break and reflecting. May the sincere and holy days of Lent be with you until Easter Sunday and throughout life in our journey as pilgrims in this world. From the YouTube channel Abundio Forcado, God bless Origin, Inspiration, and History of the Bible. No book in the history of the world has wielded as much influence on civilization as the Holy Bible. The Bible is unique in that it had God as its author. While all other books were composed by human being, it is indeed the book of books. The Deposit of Faith The Catholic Church derives all of its teaching authority from its tradition, the doctrine which has come down to it from Christ. This tradition is preserved in written form in the Bible, which contains the principal truths of faith taught to the apostles by Christ. Inspired men were moved by the Spirit of God to commit these matters to writing in the early church. Only a short time after Christ's ascension, perhaps within 20 years, the need to preserve these truths in a permanent form was recognized. Before any book was accepted as authentic, however, the authority of an apostle was demanded by the early Christian communities. Saint Mark's Gospel was accepted because he was Saint Peter's companion. Similarly, though Saint Luke was a man who had not seen Christ, his book gained acceptance through Saint Paul's authority. The Church has protected and guarded these books which contained the revelations of Christ to his disciples and their testimony concerning him. The Bible defined. The other source of supernatural knowledge is the Bible. In the words of the Council of Trent, which enumerated the books of the Bible under their proper titles, the Church declares that she receives all the books of the Testaments, old and new, since the one God is the author of both. The Vatican Council is more explicit. The Church holds those books as sacred and canonical not because, having been composed by human industry, they were afterwards approved by her authority, nor merely because they contain revelation without error, but because having been written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they have God as their author. The word, Bible, comes from the Greek Biblian meaning, the book, te plural is ta biblia, the books, in the Greek the word is a neuter, but later on the word biblia was taken for a feminine singular. The book, taken in this sense, it refers to all the books of both testaments. The Bible is the book par excellence. The Bible needs an interpreter. The Bible is extremely difficult to understand, even by Bible scholars. It was written in languages long dead, and in the manner and idiom of the time. To interpret the Bible, it is not only necessary to understand the languages in which the Bible was written, but to understand the meanings that the words of the Bible had at the time they were written. The Bible, therefore, has to be interpreted to be understood, and for Catholics, the Church, guided by the Holy Spirit, is the official guardian and infallible interpreter of the Bible. Canon of the Bible 
The Bible contains 72 books or 73, depending on whether the Book of Lamentations is listed as a separate book and not as a part of Jeremiah, varying in length from a few hundred words to many thousands. Together, these books comprise the official list or canon of the Bible. Of these books, 45 were written before the time of Christ and are called the books of the Old Testament. The other 27 books were written after the time of Christ and are called the books of the New Testament. Meaning of the word testament. The meaning of the word testament is used here as that of a pact, an agreement, or a covenant. The Old Testament is the pact or alliance that God made first with the patriarchs and then with the Jewish people through Moses. A savior is promised and a law is proclaimed, and salvation is through the law. The New Testament is the covenant or the alliance that God made with all men whereby, through the mediatorship of his Son, Jesus Christ, all men can be saved. Determination of the Bible Canon At the time the books of the New Testament were written many other pious stories and legends relating to Christ and his times were also widely circulated. As a result, in the early centuries of the Church, there was some confusion and doubt as to which books were inspired and biblical, and which were not. As far as is known, it was the Council of Hippo in AD 393 which first determined which books were inspired, and were to be included in the Bible canon, a canon in every respect, identical with the canon of the Council of Trent. Subsequent councils confirmed this decision, and the Council of Trent, in 1546, formally canonized all the traditional books of the Bible. These books comprise the Old and the New Testaments, and it is a matter of faith for Catholics to believe that all passages of all books are equally inspired. The Apocrypha those books which were rejected by the Council of Hippo as being non-biblical belong to what is called the Apocrypha. These books treat largely of the incidents and events during the life of Christ not related in the books of the Bible. They are often well worth reading as they offer much historical information not otherwise available, however. Some of these stories have slightly heretical tendencies. The Catholic use of the word Apocrypha, as defined above, should be distinguished from the incorrect Protestant use of the word. Protestants use this term to designate the seven books of the Bible included in the Catholic Bible canon, but not accepted or found in Protestant Bibles. These seven books are Tobit, Judith, Wisdom, Sirach, Baruch, 1 and 2 Maccabees, and parts of Esther and Daniel. Protestants call the books found in the Catholic Apocrypha the pseudepigraphal books. History of the Protestant Canon The difference in the Catholic and Protestant Bibles arose in the following manner. The Jews living in the few centuries before Christ were divided into two groups the Jews dwelling in Palestine and large number of Jews scattered throughout speaking Hebrew, and the large, the Roman Empire and speaking the Greek language, a consequence of the conquest of Alexander the Great O.T. Greece. Criteria of the Jewish Canon In the several centuries before the coming of Christ, the Jews in Palestine re-examined and eliminated some of the books from the existing collection as not in harmony with the Law of Moses and as of doubtful inspiration. The Pharisees set up four criteria which their sacred books had to pass in order to be included in the revised Jewish canon. One they had to be in harmony with the Pentateuch Torah Law. Two they had to have been written before the time of Ezra. Three. They had to be written in Hebrew, 4. They had to have been written in Palestine. Bible books eliminated by the Jews The application of these arbitrary criteria eliminated Judith, probably written in Aramaic, Wisdom and 2 Maccabees, written in Greek. Tobit and parts of Daniel and Esther, written in Aramaic and probably outside of Palestine, Baruch, written outside of Palestine, 
and Sarashan 1 Maccabees, written after the time of Ezra. By the LST century after Christ, this revised canon was generally accepted by all Jews. The Church recognizes the Alexandrian canon. From the earliest times, the Christian Church recognized the Jewish canon of the Greek-Roman tradition, or Alexandrian canon, as being the true Bible, Jesus himself quoted from this Bible, and not until the Reformation was this canon seriously challenged. These seven disputed books are also called the Deuterocanonical books, while the rest of the books of the Old Testament comprise the Protocanonical books. By Protocanonical books is meant the books of the first canon, books of the Old Testament accepted by both Christians and Jews. The Deuterocanonical books, books of the second canon, are those seven books found only in the Catholic canon, Luther rejected the Deuterocanonical books of the Old Testament. At one time he also eliminated Hebrews, James, Jude, and the Apocalypse from the New Testament, but later Protestants reinserted them. Today the Catholic and Protestant New Testament books are identical. Languages of the Bible The books of the Bible were originally written in three languages. Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Aramaic is a branch of the Semitic languages, and was the language used in Palestine in the time of Christ. It is the language Christ spoke. Hebrew is a Semitic language which originated in Canaan and which was passed on by Abraham and his descendants, reaching its greatest glory in the reigns of David. Solomon. It was the language of the Holy Land until about the 3rd century BC, when it was supplanted by Aramaic. The Greek language is used in the Bible is not the classical Greek as we know it today, but a dialect spread throughout the known world of the time by conquests of Alexander the Great. Most of the books of the Old Testament were written in Hebrew. While all of the New Testament, excepting Matthew, was written in Greek. The Book of Wisdom and two Maccabees were also written in Greek. Portions of the Book of Daniel, Ezra, Jeremiah, and Esther, and all of Tobit, Judith, and the Gospel of Saint Matthew were written in Aramaic. Textual Division of the Bible The Bible as originally set down was not divided into chapter and verse as we know it today. Stephen Langton Archbishop of Canterbury in the 13th century, first divided the Bible text into chapters. Santes Pagninus divided the Old Testament chapters into verses in 1528, and Robert Etienne, a printer in Paris, did the same for the New Testament in 1551. The Old Testament In the past we have tended to think of the books of the Bible as historical such as Genesis, Exodus, Kings, and Maccabees, Legal Leviticus, Deuteronomy, etc., prophetic predicting the future, and so on. An appreciation of the Jewish method of dividing the books given on the previous page may be a more helpful method. The first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy were considered the books central to their faith. They were called Torah in Hebrew. The word Torah means an instruction, not just a lesson but the kind of instruction a parent gives to a child when he wants him to obey. Many of the books which we think of as historical Joshua, Judges, Samuel and Kings were considered prophetic by the Jews, by prophetic they meant an inspired sermon. These books recounted events from their history in order to moralize. They were sermons from history. In these books we may find prophets appearing but they are prophets who act. They leave us no long sermons. They are part of the rough and tumble of life. Important kings may hardly be mentioned simply because they offered few examples to be imitated. Unimportant kings may receive more attention because they were good men. This is not our modern way of writing history, of course. Even for them it was not primarily history. 
it was rather religious editorializing. We may err by thinking of them as history. They are that but they are much more. The Jews called them the former prophets not because they came earlier in time but because they were bound into the Bible first. The prophetical books, the latter prophets, whether written by the prophet himself or by a disciple, are inspired sermons. A prophet is a man who speaks for God into his own times. He is a man concerned about his own world. He sometimes predicts the future. More frequently, it is the immediate future. When he does so he is exercising a power. That is not, strictly speaking, prophetic. It is an additional power from God. We tend to be led astray if we think of them primarily as predictors of the future. The writings are a catch-all for other books, chronicles, which we think of as history, is a many-faceted book. To call it history is to miss many of its qualities. The poetry of Psalms and wisdom literature such as Proverbs is also included in this section. Daniel, which is a special kind of literature known as Apocalypticus, included here though in the past we thought of it as among the prophetic books. On those books accepted by the Septuagint or Greek version of the Hebrew Bible but which the Jews rejected after the time of Christ are called Deuterocanonical books. They, together with parts of Daniel and Esther, are not accepted as part of the Bible by Protestants or Jews. Catholics have always revered them as such since the earliest days of the Church. The New Testament In the New Testament we think of the four Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. These are the Gospels or good news of Jesus Christ. But Acts of Apostles is the same kind of book. It is the Gospel of the Holy Spirit and depicts the work of Christ continued in the early Church. Though none of the four Gospels are a life of Christ, for they tell us very little about most of his life, they do use incidents from the life of Christ to illustrate his teaching. Primarily then, the Gospels and Acts also written by Luke present us with the message, mission, and works of Christ. Every man who saw Christ saw him from a unique perspective. These four men we call evangelists saw him from their own particular points of view. Epistles are letters of various kinds. Some are like letters to the editor that were intended to be widely circulated, not only in the church to which they were sent but throughout the territory. Others were quite private. Charming little Philemon is a short note of Paul to a convert. Still others were written in the style of a letter as a style of literature. The epistles of James and Peter are really treatises on doctrine. The last book of the Bible, Revelations, or Apocalypse is the only New Testament book written in a very popular style of the day. As with Daniel and Ezekiel in the Old Testament it was written in a kind of code of persecuted members of God's people recounting God's saving acts in the past in the face of present trials. They look forward, also to saving acts in the future based on their faith in Him. Inspiration O.E. The Bible The books of the Bible have as their principal author the Holy Spirit, although He Himself did not write them. The Holy Spirit inspired the human authors of the Bible to write down in their own words, and in the manner and style of the day, what he wanted them to write, and he guided them to the extent that they wrote faithfully what they had been taught. This working together of God and man in the writing of the Bible is called inspiration. This inspiration covers not only matters of faith and morals, but extends as well to the facts of history as related, and to the whole Bible. Biblical Inspiration Defined Pope Leo XII, in his encyclical Providentissimus Deus, explains how inspiration affected the biblical writers. By supernatural power God so moved and impelled them to write. 
He was so present to them, that they first rightly understood, then willed faithfully to write down, and finally expressed in apt words and with infallible truth the things which he ordered, and those only. Biblical References to Its Inspiration Besides the infallible teaching of the Church as to the inspiration of the Bible, we have reliable historical evidence as well. Many indirect passages in the Old Testament refer to its inspiration Isaiah 8, 1, Wisdom 7, 15, and in the New Testament Street. Paul refers to it in 2 Peter 1, 2 one Tradition confirms biblical inspiration. Tradition, too, provides overwhelming proof that from the earliest days of the Church it was believed that the Bible was inspired. The Fathers of the Church allude to it in many passages, stating variously that the books were inspired, that God is the author of the Bible, that the sacred writers were the instruments of God. Throughout history, the Church has made many official pronouncements in ecclesiastical documents reaffirming the fact of inspiration. Extent of Inspiration The Council of Trent on April 8, 1546, decreed that, those entire books with all their parts as have been accustomed to be read in the Catholic Church, must be considered as sacred and canonical. This was reaffirmed by the Council of the Vatican in 1870. In the centuries since this decree, Catholic theologians differed on two points of interpretation as to whether matters of faith and morals alone were to be considered inspired or to whether inspiration extended just to important matters. These questions were settled by Pope Leo XIII in his encyclical Providentissimus Deus, in which he reaffirmed the decisions of the Council of Trent and emphasized that the Bible in all its parts was inspired and that a stated fact must be accepted as falling under inspiration, down to the most insignificant item, that is, the whole Bible is the Word of God. History of the Bible No original manuscript of the Bible have come down to us, due to the perishable material upon which they were written and the fact that the Roman emperors decreed the destruction of the manuscripts during the Christian persecutions. While none of the original manuscripts are known to exist, some very ancient transcriptions have survived the years. Ancient Manuscripts of the Bible The oldest Hebrew manuscript known as a copy of the Book of Isaiah, written in Hebrew in the 2nd century. It was found in 1947 in a cave near Jericho. The oldest Greek fragment known to exist is in the John Ryland Library in Manchester, England. This fragment is from the 2nd century, Ad. Several thousand other ancient Greek manuscripts have been found, the three most complete and important being the Codex Sinaiticus, Codex Vaticanus, and the Codex Alexandrinus, all probably of the 4th and 5th century after Christ. The Codex Vaticanus is in the Vatican Library. Early Translations of the Bible The most important early translations of the Bible were the Septuagint and the Vulgate. The Septuagint, a Greek translation of the Old Testament, was begun about 250 BC and completed about 100 BC. This translation was made for the Jew of Egypt so that they could read their sacred books in Greek, the only language that most of them understood at that time. Before long, the Septuagint was widely used in Palestine and distributed throughout the Greek-speaking peoples of the Mediterranean world during the time of Christ and for the first century or longer of the Christian era. The Apostles of Christ used this translation in their teaching. The Bible in the first two centuries after Christ, in the early days of the Church, the scriptures were read at divine services in Greek. And Carly translation from Greek to Latin was needed for many of the Christians in the West could not understand Greek. Such translations, gathered together, made up the first, Latin Bible. Prepared by so many different people of varying education, 
the translations were uneven and inaccurate. By the second century, there were a number of Latin translations, the most widely circulated being the Old Latin, Aridula. Saint Jerome and the Vulgate Translation Because of the numerous variant readings of the Aedila, due to the copyists, revisers, or translators, Pope Damasus requested Saint Jerome to revise and correct the New Testament. Saint Jerome began his revision with the four Gospels and then revised the remaining books of the New Testament, but more hurriedly. The work was completed at Rome about A.D. 383-384. After the death of Pope Damasus, Saint Jerome went to the Holy Land. He spent 34 years there, devoting his time to revising the Bible. To exegetical works, but mainly to the great work of his life the translation of the protocanonical books of the Old Testament from Hebrew into Latin. This work extended over a period of 15 years and it was a prodigious task, for the modern Vulgate is made up of a the protocanonical books of the Old Testament with the exception of the Psalter, translated from the Hebrew by Saint Jerome, b. The Deuterocanonical books of Tobit and Judith from the Aramaic by Saint Jerome, circa the Deuterocanonical books of Wisdom, Sirach, Baruch, and 1 and 2 Maccabees from the Old Latin unrevised by Saint Jerome, d. The Deuterocanonical parts of Daniel from the Greek of Theodotion and of Esther from the Septuagint, and a. The New Testament revised from the Old Latin by Saint Jerome. The Vulgate superseded all other versions. As Saint Jerome's work on the Old Testament was a work of private enterprise, it met great opposition. He was accused of changing the text of the Bible, which was familiar to the people in the Edela or Old Latin. However, as time went on, the great merits of his work were recognized. By the 9th century, Jerome's version was universally accepted. In view of its general adoption, it gradually assumed the name of Vulgate, the Disseminated, or People's Bible. The Church approves the Vulgate. On April 8, 1546, the Church, in the Council of Trent, designated the Vulgate as the official Church translation. To this day the Vulgate remains the official version of the Church, and translations of it are found in practically every language in the world. However, it does no mean that it is to be preferred over the Septuagint or over original manuscripts, or that it was entirely free from error. On the contrary, the Church recognized certain limitations in the translations from the beginning, and ordered a revision. This revised version was published in 1592 under Pope Clement VIII. The Vulgate from Jerome to Gutenberg. Jerome's text suffered many vicissitudes throughout the ages. In assembling a complete Bible, copyists would take some of their readings, by misadventure, from the old Latin texts and some from the Vulgate, both texts were in circulation. A monk might have memorized several passages from the old version in school, then, in writing a copy of the Vulgate, subconsciously lapse into the old phrasing so familiar to him. Some of the transcribers were not exercising a critical sense and would incorporate texts from other manuscripts, parallel passages, and texts from the liturgy. The invention of printing only multiplied these problems for a time but eventually scholars were able to print a text near to the text as it came from the hands of Saint Jerome. While the Vulgate became the official version of the Western Church, it did not prevent other translations from being made. A Coptic version appeared in the second century, Ulfilas, an Arian bishop, made a Gothic translation in the fourth century, and there were numerous Syrian, Armenian, Georgian, Arabic, and Slavonic versions in the early centuries. Gutenberg and the FRST Printed Bible
The invention and development of a practical printing process by Gutenberg in the 15th century did more to revolutionize and modernize the world than any other invention. Prior to this, all manuscripts and books had to be copied by hand and only the very wealthy could ever afford to have one. At once the tedious work of the professional copyist was ended. Not only did it do away with the copyist, it eliminated the many human errors made in copying. By 1450 Gutenberg had developed the art of printing so well that he was ready to print his first book. The first book printed was the Bible, in the Latin Vulgate translation, about two years were spent in printing and binding the Bible, and it was completed in 1452. Over 200 were printed in the first edition. The Bible in print. With the invention of printing, the Bible ran through edition after edition 124 in the first 50 years, all sponsored by the Catholic Church. By the time Luther's New Testament appeared in 1522 there were 14 complete editions in German. Parallel with this in time was the appearance of 11 Italian translations, 10 French, 2 Bohemian, 1 Flemish, and 1 Russian. The Bible in English. The first complete English translation of the Bible appeared relatively late, probably not until the 14th century. However, the English people were not without the Bible in those early years, as the Latin B Vulgate was widely disseminated and in daily use. In addition, numerous paraphrases, translations, and commentaries of various Bible stories were well known through Scop and Gleeman, the popular storytellers of their day. Early history not definitely known. Much of the earlier history of the Bible in English still remains a mystery. Tradition holds that Aidan, Bishop of Landisfarne, who died in 651, encouraged his followers to read the scriptures in their own tongue. Aldhelm, Bishop of Sherburn until his death in 709, is said to have translated the Psalms into the Saxon language, between 721 and 901 various writers, including the Venerable Bede, Eadfrith. Alcuin, and King Alfred, are believed to have translated parts or all of the Bible stories into Old English. In the 10th century, a translation of the first seven books of the Bible and the Book of Job made by Eilfric, Archbishop of Canterbury from 994 to 1005, was in circulation. During the time between the death of Eilfric and the reputed work of Wycliffe in 1380, other translations are reported to have existed, however, this was a period of great transition in the English language, and practically nothing remains of these writings. It was not until the 15th century that English as we know it today emerged as a definite language. Wycliffe's translation. The next important English version is the so-called Wycliffe translation, of which over 150 manuscripts are extant. It is taken indirectly from the Vulgate. Much doubt has been cast recently on the theory that Wycliffe was responsible for this pre-Reformation Bible in recent years, since the translation is largely Catholic in tone and diction and since most of the manuscripts of this version were found in the possession of notably Catholic families. The douay Reims translation. The first complete and printed Catholic English translation that is definitely known appeared rather late, at the turn of the 16th century. This is known as the douay Reims version. It was a translation of the Latin Vulgate and was produced in France by English scholars who had fled the Catholic persecutions in England. The New Testament was published in Reims in 1582 and the Old Testament in Douai in 1610. Since the douay Reims translation, the English language has undergone continuous changes. It was necessary, therefore, to revise and bring the Bible up to date from time to time. 
Bishop Chaloner of England undertook and published a complete revision of the Douay Reims in 1750, and several less successful revisions of Paared between that time and the 20th century. Protestant Biblical Scholarship Besides the Catholic versions of the Bible mentioned above, numerous Protestant versions of the Bible in English have appeared since the Reformation. William Tyndale (1484–1536) was one of the first Protestant translators of the Bible. His translation is especially noteworthy because he translated from the original Greek versions then available to him rather than from the traditional Vulgate. Miles Coverdale translated and printed a complete English Bible in 1535, Coverdale's translation was the first English edition of the Bible to separate the deuterocanonical books from the protocanonical of the regular books. The books were put in the between the publication of Coverdale's Bible and the King James or Authorized Version, other less important translations took place. Noteworthy among these were the Taverner's Bible, the Great Bible, Cranmer's Bible, the Geneva Bible, and the Bishop's Bible. The King James When James I ascended the throne of England in 1603, numerous and variant Protestant Bibles were in circulation. In 1604 preparations were, therefore, made to undertake a revision of the Protestant Bible, a group of scholars was organized, and using the Bishop's Bible as the basis for their new translation, produced by King James Version, which was published in 1611. While of great literary merit, Protestants themselves recognized many, serious defects in the translation. In 1881, 1885 a revision was made, and this is popularly known as the Revised Version. Many other modern versions are also published today, the most important, perhaps, being the Revised Standard Version published in 1952. More recently the New English Version, among others have been published. Present Catholic Biblical Scholarship Pope Leo XIII gave the modern impetus to Bible study when he issued his famous encyclical, Providentissimus Deus, which set up standards for all future Bible scholarship. In addition, he established the Biblical Commission in 1902 to study and to give answers to Biblical questions. In 1890 M. J. Lagrange, O. P founded the École Biblique at Jerusalem and also established the periodical Review Biblique. The Biblical Institute was established in Rome in 1908 by Pius X to give advanced training to Biblical scholars. In 1907 the Biblical Commission asked the Benedictine Order to undertake the task of revising the Vulgate, and this translation is still in process undeaf the direction of the English Jesuit. Reverend Cuthbert Latte, English and American scholars produced the Westminster edition of the Sacred Scriptures directly from the Greek and Hebrew texts. Other modern versions include a translation of the New Testament from the original languages by Father F. Spencer, O. P. and IHIS was published in 1937. A complete translation of the Bible was made by Monsignor. Ronald Knox of England in 1950 and has attained wide popularity because the modernness and clarity of its language. Confraternity Translation of the Bible In the United States in the last 40 years, there has been a general revival of religion and the hierarchy felt a great need toward an accurate modern translation of the Bible. Out of this has developed translation of the Bible by American scripture scholars, sponsor CD by the Confraternity of Christian Doctrine. The first task of this group was to prepare a modern edition of the Chaloner revision of the Douay Reims English translation of the Bible. Proceeding with this, they published the New Testament in 1941 and then began the translation of the Old Testament. However, Pope Pius XL issued his encyclical, Divino Afflant Spiritu, 
in 1943 which dealt with, among other things, the need for a new translation of the Bible directly from the original languages of the sacred authors. For this reason, the further revision of the Chaloner Douay Reims version was abandoned. The Confraternity then began the Hugh translation of the Old Testament directly from the original Hebrew and of the New Testament from the original languages. The New American Bible is a culmination of their efforts. Revised New Testament translation. Since the introduction of the New American Bible in 1970, interest and participation in Bible study has increased rapidly. Awareness of this trend combined with the experience of its actual use, especially in oral proclamation, provided a basis for a revision of the original New Testament text. Begun in 1978 and completed in 1986, the threefold purpose of this revision also expressed in the preface of the first edition, was T0. Provide a version suitable for liturgical proclamation, for private reading and for purposes of study. An additional concern of the editors was the production OA version as accurate and faithful to the original Greek text as possible, at the same time, special attention was paid to ensure that the language chosen not only reflected contemporary American usage, but eliminated all discrimination especially against women whenever possible. More abundant introductions, footnotes and explanatory material were also added to facilitate devotional reading and make the revision more suitable for purposes of study. The New American Bible is a Roman Catholic translation. This revision, however, like the first edition, is the result of collaboration with scholars from other Christian churches, both among the revisers and members of the editorial board. These photos were collected and edited for videos not for commercial purposes, but for educational purposes in spreading the good news and the truth about how the Holy Bible was formed. We see in our time today, the mentions of history were taken from the preface of My Holy Bible The New American Bible School and Church Edition 1970. This Bible was translated from the original languages with critical use of all the ancient sources. And I am thankful for all the resources, knowledge, abilities, and time given to us by our Lord God. Therefore, let's give it back to Him through our simple and sincere purpose to the best of our abilities. The glory and praise are for our Lord God. Let's not forget to pray, and for those who want to help in our continuous creation of vlogs like this, you can help me by continuously watching my vlogs, liking, commenting, and clicking on my notification bell to stay updated with my features. Thank you very much from Abundio Forcado YouTube channel. God bless all.